I think we can get started. We've got one hour allocated for this discussion, and my name is Vladimir Knyaginin, and I represent the Center for Strategic Development, both for Moscow and for St. Petersburg region. And I will moderate our today's discussion. And this discussion is called the City Factory of the Future. And as far as I can see, in English, it is translated, it was translated like manufacturing of the future. Well, we'll talk about a fairly important subject today, but let me introduce the, our speakers first. We have Mark Bridley here, the head of CAS Cities, London Metropolitan Universities. And I've looked at the website. I looked at what your research group is doing. And it is important to note that you are fighting for protection of industrial heritage. And Igor Ishenko is our next speaker, general director of Technopolis Moscow. And Technopolis also has uh, a status of free economic zone. So they've got their land plot, they've got their asset, and some sort of tax benefits or tariff preferences. I think if we, if we try to hold a similar event in Technopolis, we will have better terms. Vladimir Pereskov, the head of engineering center, pro prototyping center in the University of Mises. It's, it's University of Steelmaking, which was recently incorporated with Moscow Mining University. So it currently has become an educational conglomerate which prepares students on a variety of industrial prof engineering professions. And also Kate Sophis, general director of San Francisco Made Urban Manufacturing Alliance. And I also looked at your website. And San Francisco is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And I think it has a fair claim. It claims to be the most beautiful city of the United States. It has it enjoys a large traffic of tourists. It's the front line of the Silicon Valley. And this city is also fighting for protecting its industrial architectural heritage. So we, we, we've got a lot to talk about, and we uh, we have an interesting discussion in front of us. So I will be moderating this discussion and asking questions. But let's start with, um, let's say, blitz survey. I'll, I'll ask you one and the same question to all of you. And I want to get a brief and quick answer. So here, we've got Richard Florida speaking. And I remember his book which was published early in, in the year of 2000, and it was translated into a number of languages. And he was saying that cities are very creative agglomerates, uh, so they need to say no to the industry completely, because the creative class creates value by itself, a value in the form of new design, engineering developments, software, so in the, in the form of value, which is associated with brands, senses, and so on. And there was the uh, U-curve. And on the horizontal line, you have the stages of the life cycle stages of, of, of a product. And on the vertical line, you have margin. And the largest portions of the margin was in at the extreme ends of this U-curve. 
at the market at the marketing section and development sections and manufacturing was regarded as something which can be easily outsourced let's say to china let them do this or let's uh, outsource it to indonesia so my question is this that concept was very popular early in 2000 in the year of 2000s and richard florida was a very popular keynote speaker he published a book which is called new crisis of cities and and so he was uh, the previous book was the previous book was written when he was in detroit and he believed he believed that everything can be saved by the creative class but if you have visited if if you have ever visited shanghai if you have seen those skyscrapers uh, you have felt the vibrant the atmosphere in the city so you may have asked yourself a question is there anything which can rival this force, the sheer force of the city. And now Richard Florida is saying that we get a be we better get back to manufacturing. So why the U-curve has changed? Why manufacturing is back on stage? Why, why the experts are saying that we've got to resume it or we it, so oh, we just made a mistake 10 or 15 years ago, and we've got to get back on track. We've got to make sure that cities retain their manufacturing capabilities. Mark, shall we start with you? Just, just give me a brief answer to this question. Are we pro-manufacturing or are we against it? First, cinemas were dying, and I remember the discussion about how there would not be any cinemas in the future, and now there are cinemas growing everywhere in cities uh, like London. I think it's just a, a rule of life that if you write something off, it has a habit of sneaking up on you and reviving. And that's what's happening to manufacturing, particularly in urban areas, in mature cities. So we are saying that we're getting back to the industrial agenda. So it is becoming significant again for the cities, doesn't it? Went away, some went away, but there's still a lot that remained, and that's providing the soil from which new is growing. Mark, Kate. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Kate, your turn. And I would also argue that manufacturing is part of the creative class and that what we discovered by trying to remove the center out of the productive cycle from design <coughs> to fulfillment, that you end up taking the heart out of the innovation capacity. And we learn the hard way by seeing our communities and our designers stop understanding how to actually make the very products they were designing. And we've certainly seen that happening in Silicon Valley. And we have discussion now, even among some of the technology companies, about can we do some of the production, at least, back closer to the source of design, because design and making and manufacturing go hand in hand. And in that sense, the agglomeration of cities where you have in close proximity someone who knows how to design a product, someone who knows how to make the product, someone who knows how to sell, all of that happening in a dense urban area just continues to spin the cycle of innovation more quickly and more efficiently. And I would add, it speaks to the culture of the city in which that manufacturing is done. And that is also an important part of making sure as our communities that we hold on to the special cultural elements uh, that define our cities. Uh, Keith. Uh, uh, Keith, and just a brief question to catch up with what you've said. Uh, we haven't lost that moment yet, have we? Probably China is far ahead of us already in terms of manufacturing. It, it, it's a powerhouse, a world economy. It's the center of world manufacturing. So, so now they, they I, I try to go to China on a yearly basis, and I see how this country is changing. And I now ask myself a question, whether we'll be able to catch up with them at all. I mean, they, they 
Haven't we missed those 15 or 20 years completely? My view is it's less about catching up and more about redefining the game. And I think what we're finding, and you know, I will say conversely to some of the dialogue that you may hear sometimes coming out of the US that we want to bring all the manufacturing back, we're all in a global economy now. So I think that making decisions about where you want to produce the product, and in many cases, it's staying closer to the customer, um, is the way we need to think about production. So here in Russia, it may not be that you're going to get it all back from China any more than we would in the US, but it may be about really thinking about, well, what are your core competencies that make sense to be done here, either because you are supplying a consumer base here in this country or in the region, or because you have a special expertise uh, such as mining. And so it's about capitalizing on that, all of us, and being interconnected in a global supply chain is the reality that we all have to operate in. Thank you, Kit. And we just, we just uh, learned that uh, GE was squeezed out of S&P 500 for the first time in the history of this rating. And Tesla finally took decision to build a manufacturing plant in China because now they are lagging behind their production targets and the Chinese uh, promised them that they will be able to ramp up production within eight months. But thank you for the answer. I get the point. So Igor, let's get back to rethinking the industrial function of cities. I, I think we are back already, and it's it's stupid not to use the resource which which you have in the city. I'm talking about the educational capacity of Moscow. More than 50% of our universities and educational facilities are located here in Moscow. Every year, more than 100,000 uh, technical experts graduate from our universities and now risks. Any, any kind of economy, and like Moscow economy, needs to diversify its risk. Now, we see America has relocated its production to China, and now it has, it has all the risks associated with it. Okay, I may be, I may be exaggerating a bit, but I'm doing, the, I'm doing it for the purpose of discussion. And another thing, so what else is there to do? What else is there to do? Let's say if you have squandered the resource that was aggregated by previous generation, you need to look for new formats. You need to look for new opportunities. And you need to tap into the potential of the global economy, looking into something which can help you to focus on a particular, particular area. OK. Uh, I wouldn't ask you any any other questions right now, probably later. But let's tr try to imagine that the, a representative of the largest city agglomeration in the country, and yes, yesterday it was mentioned that more than 28 percent of GD, national GDP is associated with Moscow. Moscow is this political, social, financial center of the country. How can we explain to all these young people and young generations, how, how can we, uh, let's say, make them believe that they should go for a manufacturing job and not for a job in, in, the, in the office. So I do hope you have an answer to this question. And also, it will be, it will be interesting to compare what you've got to say with what uh, a representative of London has got to say. This is one of the city which aspires to be the ca capital of venture funds. And so Igor believes that um, 
the graduates from the mining school will go for production jobs. I can hardly think of this. Where will they find where will they find mining, let's say where will where will they find a mine in Moscow? Or let's say if you're a graduate of a steel um, and steel and alloys uh, department. There are no steel mills in Moscow, are they? So we face a situation as follows. Uh, Moscow is the financial center. And uh, Moscow is a decision-making center. So uh, a lot of corporate headquarters are located here. And these corporations produce very complex products. Uh, when it came when when it came to prototyping to pro, to prototyping things from the aerospace industry or from the pharmaceutical medical uh, area or from the defense area, there is always a question: Where do you build this prototype? And we have built a prototyping center. I will recently tell you more about it. It's like a magic wand. It's a very compact. Uh, place, just 16 people, but it's pinpoint digital production. You can produce virtually anything there. Let's say t today we can produce um, some medical appliance, and tomorrow we can start building a rocket engine there. But if you need to build a large amount of cars, you probably have to put your productions, production uh, facility in China. But as far as a creative product is concerned, as far as something which has never been produced before, it is highly likely that you will have to produce it in cities because a city attracts the best minds, the very creative people, very experienced people. And you were right in saying that Moscow is the financial center, and Moscow is the center of where these resources are available. And now we are talking about putting some parts of this, uh, of these production facilities to Komsomolsk on Amur or Samara so that so that we could have smaller teams located there. OK. So we are discussing um, a topic which is almost unthinkable um, as an item of the agenda of an urban forum. Let's see if we look back, if we look five years back. But the question is, what kind of job should the young people take? We are going to review four cases now. We'll listen to four stories and every time you listen to somebody somebody's stories, you think whether you can get some whether you can emulate this experience, whether you can integrate this experience into what you are doing. And all of these are four different stories. And I think it will be important to take notice of these differences and, and try to think uh, whether we can emulate this experience. Mark, let's start with you. London Metropolitan University, which is part of the top 20 leading universities in the world as far as I understand, right? Or top 20 universities in Great Britain, that's for sure. And it is among top 100 universities across the globe. So it's in charge of industrial function of the City of London. Thank you. I'll do a micro lecture in eight minutes, so forgive me for being very uh, rapid. A good city has industry. To deliver on that statement, we will uh, have to face a big challenge. Great cities must find new ways to evolve to refresh this welcome for industry. In my own city, like most others, the industrial economy, economy is actually dominated by everyday support for our lives. That city-serving economy is no small matter, humdrum, hidden, but vital. It needs to be near and nimble. Where's my parcel, my groceries, my bus? Thousands of depots deliver what we need and what we want. This is London's fresh from the wrappers new Waitrose 
home delivery depot. We'll need many more of these big ones as well as small ones. And the majority of our city manufacturing businesses are closely hooked to the urban market, producing just-in-time and bespoke wares ranging from sandwiches, dairy products to stage sets. All of this will grow strongly in our fast-expanding cities. My own city will need more, not less, than its current 100-plus steel fabricators, 250 printers, more wood workshops, stone cutters, ready meal preparers. No doubt it's the same in Moscow. Huge investment is going into volume bakeries. Craft bakery popularity, small wholesale bakeries in London. We've now got over 150. We had almost none a few years ago. They were extinct. These trends are magnified by increasing city prosperity, burgeoning interest in local origin. For example, the rapid decline of tailoring in London has reversed. We now have 70 uh, bespoke tailoring businesses on scale. There's a reshoring momentum. Humbrol paint loved by model makers for years produced in China, but recently a London company won the contract to manufacture it and a factory just around the corner from my own factory are proud to make the paint tins. The death of mature city manufacturing was in fact exaggerated Albion Knitting Co began in 2014. The first industrial scale, fully fashioned flat knitter established in that city in the last 80 years. They serve locally based luxury brands who want both sampling and production nearby. Food production has been the fastest to evolve following craft beer and coffee phenomenon that gave us 50 breweries, two dozen wholesale roasteries. London now has also distilleries, soft drink producers, doubling its count to six of each, and a huge number of niche food producers. Let's make things, say the people with beards. New enthusiasm for making is strengthening the dynamic. Here's one of the open workshops that are helping this popularization. In London, from nothing, just over 50 have sprung up. 5,000 people work in the Bombardier aircraft factory in Belfast. Well, it started as Short Brothers making hot air balloons in a London railway arch. Hundreds of such stories. We need industry in cities because they are our most innovative places, seedbed for this constant nourishment of the economy. But we're losing the space for all this vitality, we've been kicking it for decades. In many cities, the capacity for a flexible everyday economy has been dissolving. London is eating itself. That city is growing at such a pace with such tight constraint of land supply that conflict between uses has heightened. Housing is taking out the ability to welcome the phenomenon is now widespread. To get the cities we want able to accommodate full economic life, we must learn to embrace the diverse, weave it in, and we must invent. The challenges repeat across the world and the response is starting to show we have a type challenge. It's a long time since this all came naturally to us. So the task includes hunting for examples. I'm busy with that his suburban depth in Stambor, a humble factory in Leighton, metal workers in a housing block in Vienna, builders, material suppliers in Brussels, in that same city of miracles, this Leonidas warehouse, well integrated. The Godiva factory is part of a super varied urban block nearby a big tire warehouse, happily alongside housing and showrooms, car repairers, underneath housing. This is one of Europe's most ubiquitous types of integration in Napoli alongside shops and cafes. Rotterdam adeptly tucked below flats in London in a classic piece of high street depth. Back in Salento, a pasta shop with street frontage and behind it they have the 200 square meter factory 
tiny example of what we should do. And we should do more like London's big bus garages, immovable and integrated. We eagerly look for new examples, like this spontaneous one in the used car export area of Brussels, residential above a big yard entrance. And as London grows, we look at the developments that could so easily incorporate more mix, but don't. There's a large housing development just near my factory that could so easily incorporate more mix, welcoming the biggest spaces we need, but it doesn't. It houses a school. It could have taxi repairs or a production facility. This huge new supermarket has living above the big lorries and the yard and the noise are all incorporated into the building. If that's possible, then why not fabricators? Why not a courier depot? Recently finished, in fact, this is housing on top of a big builder's merchant in London. In Munich, they are making Gewerbehof, multi-story workshop buildings to house businesses being priced out of the city. Hamburg are doing the same. Also near the center of that city, plans for multi-level industrial. In Vancouver, this development will combine 350 flats 1,200 square meters of offices, 6,000 of industrial. In West London, an aggregate wharf with residential. It doesn't get much harder than that. Soon to be built, three-story logistics commences soon. That's a small example, in fact, of what's becoming particularly popular in Japan here. In the US, such stacked industrial is about to emerge, Brooklyn, Bronx. Finally, our students at the CAS, amongst those exploring how it's to be done physically, architecturally, in areas of the city. The topic is now in play. A new type of mix where the alternative would be just residential. In Brussels, an exhibition I helped make happen focused on <laughs> hosting industry in the city. There, the political support is growing, the real projects are brewing. They're just a few first steps, but we will have a big mountain to climb here, testing our friends, Karakusevich, Carson Architects, points towards this kind of future in cities, industry and housing together, a bold plan floated for part of London. More of these places, please, until it becomes normal, until our cities welcome industry again. I have two questions for you. Well, the first question, if uh, we uh, go back to what Igor was talking about, so we lost mass production. So basically, we are freeing up the city, for the industry, well, the traditional industry, let's say, conveyor belt, Ford, huge base, you know, manufacturing base. So we are freeing it up for other industry, for other types of production or manufacture. It depends on the city, but certainly that looks like the case in London. We've, we don't have any big process plants. The biggest uh, factory in London is a Ford factory with 2,000 people, so it's not huge any longer. We're unlikely to attract those businesses again. But other cities uh, may. We've got other cities in the UK building car factories, for example, on a very big scale. So it depends on the city. And I have a second question for you. Your CAS school, do you mainly do research or are you guys a think tank or a do tank? Do you actually do things? Or do you just collect the ideas, uh, repackage them? So are you the agents of change or the observers? So you observe and write and record how everything is happening. Well, I'm part of making things happen. So yeah, it, it blurs together between CAS and the other things I do. I've always been involved in making those projects happen. So I'm really involved uh, on the ground. Yes, indeed, uh, working. Uh, pushing the city government and the local governments across London on these kind of initiatives. 
И в этом смысле вы агенты. So here you are the agents of change. Кейт, вопрос к вам. Кейт, I have a question for you. Thank you very much, Mark. What about your experience? Tell us a little bit about San Francisco. It is a wonderful city, which is uh, never too hot, never too cold, full of absolutely happy people who can drive to Stanford, to Berkeley. They can do whatever they want. So they can, uh, I don't know, ask for startup funding. They can apply to the entire world for the financing. So what do you do? Well, I guess you might have a slightly different experience than, than we do living there, um, but thank you. Uh, so I'll tell you a quick story about uh, San Francisco and the journey of um, our doing organization, SF Made, uh, which was created about eight years ago. But the story starts similar to many of your communities that San Francisco also used to be a town of big scale mass production manufacturing. Levi Strauss was one of our iconic brands that was manufactured in the city and actually the last Levi's factory closed not that long ago in 2002 uh, in San Francisco. We also have a very rich history in agriculture and in canning and food processing because California continues to be one of the big agricultural producers in the U.S. Uh, this is an example from the old Del Monte canning factory uh, in Fisherman's Wharf. We, like many cities, also have a very strong and had a very strong craft brewing industry. This is our one of uh, 15 breweries that used to be in, operating in the city. Um, and then we actually did shipbuilding and ship repair, particularly during uh, World War II, and that also used to be a big employer. Fast forward to the end of that part of the story, uh, all this stuff is gone. So I think very similar to London, very similar to what you all experience in your communities. Um, however, out of that, we have been seeing, probably starting about 10 to 15 years ago, a burgeoning uh, rebirth of a different scale of manufacturing. And I think the story of SF Made is not about actually finding the Tesla to replace the General Motors factory or finding the next Levi's. It's actually creating a whole new scale of economy with a lot of small companies who are innovative and very closely connected to the community. Some examples, um, we have a very rich history also of art and artistry. This is actually a, a recently made model here in the city. Uh, but out of the skill of metalworking has come a whole subset of small manufactured products that were really defined by the artists and the welding culture that we have in the community. We have out of what used to be big scale garment manufacturing, a whole new set of companies that are using some of the, the skilled sewers who used to work at Levi's and Gap and other brands and are now harnessing those individuals to work in new kinds of companies. This is a larger manufacturer for us called Timbuktu that makes customized bags where you can go into a store order it and it will be produced and shipped to you or picked up by you within one week. So that's one example of one of the competitive advantages of having a manufacturer of a smaller nimble size in a city is you can actually do custom to order and configurable small batch production in a way that's profitable and allows you to charge more and sustain higher costs of being in the city. Similarly, we don't have a big Del Monte plant anymore but our second largest sector of manufacturers right now in San Francisco are food and beverage. And this is a good example of a newer food product from a uh, entrepreneur from Indonesia who has created a coconut jam that both takes on the trendiness of coconut water, which I think is probably here and everywhere, but she's using her family's recipe from Indonesia. So it's a combination of our immigrant community, which we have very strong immigrant communities in San Francisco, and a new product. And then this example, I think, also speaks to we are really starting to see a convergence of new technologies with consumer products. And that informs many of the younger, uh, fast-growing manufacturers we have in the city. This is an example of a company called Dodo Case that is literally combining book binding with the very technology that is obsoleting books, the iPad. 
And similarly, a guitar manufacturer who is traditionally trained in the craft of making guitars, but he invented a whole new composite that is environmentally sustainable and has now created a whole line of travel guitars and has also spun off a new uh, material company that licenses the composite to other kinds of companies. So long and short, we realized about eight years ago that it was time to organize these small companies differently. So SF Made really was launched as a public-private partnership between a number of the smaller manufacturers that were in the city and the city of San Francisco itself. So we are an independent nonprofit organization, but we work in very close partnership with both the manufacturers and the city of San Francisco. And some of the things that we have done in the last eight years, one of the things we've done, which I say any city can do, is to simply elevate the fact that we have manufacturing to our own community, not only for consumers to know, hey, I can actually buy things that are made here, but frankly to young people as well, to the next generation, to inspire them that a manufacturing career for someone might be a job in someone else's company, but for many of our companies, it's a new business and entrepreneurship opportunity that we want young people to be thinking about. We spend a lot of time, because we have many consumer product brands, helping elevate and helping them market themselves to the community and beyond. Our SF Made logo is not only the logo of our organization, it's actually used by the companies to help market their products um, outside of San Francisco. We have directories now of all of the manufacturers in the city that are used to engage visitors who come to San Francisco. How many of us have gone to an airport or other transit location in a city and would like to potentially purchase something authentic and local, but all you used to be able to get in San Francisco was a snow globe of the Golden Gate Bridge made in China. Now we actually can bring authentic products to visitors of the city, which helps our manufacturers sell more, but also provides a more authentic uh, experience to the community. We also um, help companies raise money, and this is a important piece of this, is that if they can't, uh, we, we always say the things companies need to grow are expertise, people, money, and space. We'll get to space in a minute. Uh, that's been an important part of what SF Made does, is works with companies uh, to raise capital. Uh, this is an example of a program that we launched a few years ago with our schools, uh, specifically with our high schools. So these are young people aged 16, 17, 18 years old. And we now have a whole set of programs that we call a makership um, that takes uh, young people and puts them into paid apprenticeships at manufacturers over the summer. And it's a different model than a trade school. Many of our manufacturers, this is one of our larger breweries, are not necessarily needing to have students who have very specific skills in one area. They're actually willing to train on the job. And that's been an important part of getting young people be engaged in manufacturing and women. Uh, we also have a central place where we screen uh, companies uh, to help them hire. So we have an integrated job posting uh, for all of the manufacturers, and that lets us make it easier for companies to find workers and vice versa. And last but not least, we are very constrained with space. The biggest challenge we have in San Francisco right now is the cost of housing and how li limited our space is. So having controls that protect the industrial parts of the city has been a very, very important part of helping maintain any of our manufacturing. And then we now work very collaboratively with developers, very similar to some of the ideas that Mark put forth, to create mixed-use industrial housing and commercial projects. And I will leave you with this last slide. This is a project that is nearing completion next month. That is the city's first new multi-tenant manufacturing building in about 20 years. And it is paid for in part by the office project that we built alongside it, which is the new worldwide headquarters of Adobe. So here you have technology reinforcing uh, the new maker economy. Thanks. Thank you. And I will not ask you this question now. 
I've got to ask Igor because he's got to leave shortly. He's got an urgent matter to attend. Um, Igor, so a question to you. You've listened to what Mark has got to say. Mark told about London, Brussels, Naples, and we see that industry is making its way back to the city. Jane Jacobs was saying when they started to demolish old warehouses in New York, they have given this space to developers. And after doing so, they re realized that those warehouses were Fill, full to fill to, to the brim with small businesses, and then after demolishing them, they asked ourselves a question: Why did we? Why did we do this? We eliminated an entire an entire business sector, whereas, whereas we have just given it to developers, to people in nice suits with silk ties. So, experience of San Francisco, Lon London, and other cities. So, what about Moscow? How does Moscow fit into the same into the same pattern? Because St. Petersburg, as far as I remember, was proud of having Toyota and Nissan, GE, GM, sorry, Hyundai, Volvo. So they have come and set up their production facilities in St. Petersburg area. In 2008, the crisis hit. GM laid off all the people, sold off all the all the all its production lines, and just disappeared into the thin air. So so what about you? Do you think experience of our foreign colleagues can be used in Moscow? Like Volvo, Toyota, and Nissan, Levi Strauss. So what do we expect? So I think Moscow is is in a fairly good situation. Ask them, that depends on how you look at it. Yeah, but you need to know where to go and where to look. But but I would say that we may have we may we may feel a certain squeeze in terms of um, good good and experienced people. But let me answer your first question. When we, when we contacted management of a Moskvich car manufacturing plant, we didn't, find, we didn't find lots of small businesses there. We have found the classical post-Soviet industrial area with concrete fences and with a lot of people, uh, with a lot of people which were not, who were not creating value, who were not focused on doing anything, on who, who didn't want to work officially and pay taxes. So they didn't create any value for the city's economy. So that's one thing. Second thing is, I think that the city, which has from 15 to 20,000 hectares of industrial areas, so land of industrial use, which actually uses from 7 to 10 percent of this land. Um, it's just at the starting position. And here we have people who have, long, who have answered this question long ago. But they had to, so if you take Russian econo economy model or Chinese economy model or American economic model, you can hardly force investors to invest here and or make their money here. But anyway, you, if you have a concept, you should put your money where your mouth is. And it's not just about renovating these industrial areas and making utilities available, so like water supply and electricity. It is about building an ecosystem. It is about providing people with an opportunity to create in the industrial perspective. It is, so it is a way to make fee, people feel themselves proud of their profession. And I graduated from a university in 1994, and I was a specialist in orient, oriental culture. Normally, 
I would go to work for the intelligence body, but I didn't get the job. And now we have an opportunity. Now we see some micro decisions being made in Moscow. Now we see that uh, technoparks for kids are becoming available, like for technoparks focused on robotics, on industrial design. And we have kids who acquire preliminary industrial experience there. So they don't have studies, they don't have studies of physics there. They, they deal with applied things. So we have computers on those sites, and these computers are available for free. And because we do have a lot of talented kids, kids here, and these kids need to be navigated, navigated, so that they don't, uh, so that they know at fifth when they are 15 years old which job they're going to have or which university they're going to go. And after they graduate from the university, they know very clear, clearly which company they're going to work for because they will be already, they, they, they will already have some predetermined industrial areas available for them. And that kind of approach does change the city as well. And and in terms of things like, in terms of those notorious uh, districts like um, Tikstilsikir district, which was also called Ghetto, now we have Technopolis, Moscow Technopolis in Tikstilsikir, and it's becoming a trendy place. This is not, this is not a place where you have lots of barbed wire and concrete fences. This is the place for people to spend time at. People can come there. People can come there, try themselves, try their skills and their profession. But then again, even though we have the status of the free economic area, which is just 207 hectares, but we still have 20,000 hectares of other industrial land available. So, and our key customer is um, the government of Moscow, but we, we expect to develop a pool of private customers because a lot of investors a lot of investors have been investing into industrial industrial land just to park their money somewhere and they need to they need to get their money out and they need to invest it in infrastructure like into construction or in in transportation infrastructure and we need, we need to focus on changing the face of the industry. We need to become part of the world supply chain processes. Because let me reiterate my point. We have a big number of people who would gladly work for Western companies, but Western companies which would be located here. And we have... Um, so, uh, state, uh, st there is a lot of red tape uh, in, in this area, but, but if, if, we, if we take a look at what the, the opportunities which are available for us, we can do all the hardware for the software companies. We can. I think Moscow stands to become the second India or the first Russia. No, sorry, I don't want to become the second India. I do not insist on this. Because I think we need to catch up with the leaders first, and then we can try to overcome them. Okay, but let's let's set the mark on great on the UK or United States because India will not be a worthy target. But Kate, I think, has up to 600 of these small businesses in her portfolio. So, so what is the scale of, what is the size of the business segment in your techno park? We have 130 companies operating on our territory uh, of the size from medium to large and the, and 90% of companies 
which are allocated in this free economic zone, they don't have their own R&D facilities or capacity. However, we know that those companies which don't have their own R&D capacity, they can be squeezed out of the market in five years from now. And our colleagues have come up with examples from the, from the European experience and American experience. We understand that there is a lot of difference between the US and Europe. But, so uh, what about, so it, it, it's about putting small businesses into residential areas and building combined industrial and residential and commercial areas. And it's about diversifying industry. Do you think that this experience can be valuable for Moscow? And I'm not talking about uh, now. I'm talking about the future. Do you think we can use it? I think Moscow is taking a different way. We have a different different sanitary norms and standards, and that has an impact on our life. Moscow currently faces a huge problem, uh, and it's mi migration, a swing migration. It's, uh, I I'm talking about those commuters which uh, travel to Moscow in the morning and then back from Moscow in, in the evening. So we have this transportational problem. And finally, we end up with skewed structure of the economic system, and we have a lot of unhappy people. An urban forum, the purpose of it sh should be to think about what, how we can make these people happy. So w what does Moscow do in terms of structuring its urban space? How do we create the balance between a professional life and personal life. So, so on one hand, on one hand, we are after large-scale solutions, and Technopolis Moscow is one of them. On the other hand, we work fairly remotely from, from, from the city, but we are trying to integrate these um, we are trying to develop integrated territories which would have educational establishments and other facilities available at the same place. I understand your, I understand your, I get your answer. Uh, and, but I, I see Vladimir Pirushkov looking at me very attentively and we are a bit pressed for time. But I'd like to draw your attention to one thing. Our, co our colleagues work with activists with those who already are, already come from the urban environment. They don't, they don't get to production uh, from, from somewhere else. And that helps to structure the interaction with the city dwellers differently. So they live there, they are integrated into the city environment, and they will keep working there. Uh, so the key thing, the key thing for them is creating an active city community. The more active it is, the more into, the more vibrant is the strategy. This is why I asked I asked Mark about these agents of change. These people work there, and you live next door to them. I remember visiting Google Compass in London, and the girl who was guiding the teams who come to London asking for, asking for a grant for the startup, and they told them that they are accommodated around Google campus. They only have 6,000 6, pounds for the campaigns. And she was telling us the, the accommodation conditions are not very good, and, um, and then she stopped and said, I also live here in the same conditions. So Vladimir, Mark said that the universities, in their case, act as agents of change. And your aspiration is to employ 16 engineers, buy a lot of uh, very difficult tooling 
and machine building equipment, build a rocket, build a rocket and send it out to the space. But what do you do if it doesn't take off? How much, uh, how, how much does your lab cost? One billion rubles. How much was that in dollars? It's about $30 million at that exchange rate, $30 million. For $30 million will be enough for Kate to build, let's say, uh, um, half, half a street. We also build a lot, but underground. But let me briefly tell you about our center and uh, five minutes, OK. The innovation will be the key factor of uh, the world growth, and everyone understands that. So we decided to be proactive. and. So we decided to focus on R&D, research and development. And uh, companies tend, uh, countries tend to spend varying amounts on R&D activities. Uh, the, the US is spending about 500 billion, and Russia is spending about 30. And it's very difficult to remain competitive, uh, given, given this imbalance, and it's very difficult to maintain the ambitions of our state. So there is innovation and there is modernization. Modernization means increasing complexity over time. If you take a sewing machine, this is what it looks like. Zinger sewing machine, then the, it's optimum um, option and a more complex one with a variety of options. The optimum mechanism was invented 100 years ago, and since then it has become ever more complex. So innovation basically is um, moving to something entirely new. Once we realized that, it was important for us to realize how complex all of the processes that um, we are part of are. Basically, what can we do to shift uh, from a sewing machine, right, without hitting any additional buttons? How can we get a 3D printer out of it? And I think what I'm trying to say is, is that we are overcomplicating things without truly understanding the nature of optimization. Having realized that, we developed an engineering center which uh, provides full access to engineering processes that can contribute uh, to building uh, prototypes of uh, truly advanced things. So it's uh, all underground under the Moscow Steel and Alloys University. We have 16 people working there. We also uh, built a special engineering school, which is uh, trying to find solution for more complicated uh, tasks. So we are partnered up with MIT, the Soul Systems, and the Russian company Kinetics. We have very varied clients. Um, clients on the left uh, were the ones who came first. Clients, uh, they used to be automotive uh, companies, but on the right, we have a lot of companies working in the airspace industry. There was the first Russian product, the second, the third Russian made uh, product. So, this is um, basically a spaceship that we built together with the Russian Space Manufacturing Corporation. Right now, we are manufacturing satellites. We are using 3D uh, printing from, for the defense industry. That's uh, what uh, uh, we're also doing. We've started going into medicine. Uh, you know, we're developing things that can read your mind and transfer that information over distance. So the next uh, direction for us is to move into transportation and things like this. And another thing uh, that we're doing, I still have, what, a minute left. Well, we also have a project focusing on kids. So we are trying to inspire kids, uh, to empower them, to give them creativity. So we have a, a pilot project next uh, to the city of Troitsk. So this is um, 
something that attracts, uh, you know, a typical Russian family, a mother, two children, and the weekend father, you know, who is always at work. So we created a whole ecosystem for families that includes sport, technology, and culture. So we want to contribute to the creation of a new creative class. Thank you very much, Vladimir. I do apologize. I was asking a lot of questions, uh, but unfortunately, we have to stop our session. It is time for the next discussion. But um, to conclude, unfortunately, it falls to me to conclude this question, uh, session. And I have to say that we all got a chance to look at different experience experiences uh, that uh, showed us how to support these activists and the martial experience, specialization, martial districts, uh, organized clusters. So we'll do this, we'll move there, and we'll be the first. So let's live and see. <laughs> You know, cities are living and breathing things. They all develop at their own pace. So we'll see who comes on top, who will be, or which city will be the most successful. But to tell you the truth, when I visited Detroit, it already looked much better. Of course, it still had a number of dilapidated buildings, so buildings with broken windows. And once they were through this industrial slump, basically, once they went through this industrial measles, they've started getting better. Maybe Detroit is not as beautiful as some other cities, but you can see some life there. In this uh, case, we see that the Rust Belt is getting a new coat of varnish. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank our speakers.